Hello, everyone. Nice to see you virtually. Uh, you're being joined by uh, our colleagues at Circle. I would like to briefly introduce yourself. Um, our VP of Treasury and Corporate Finance, Patrick Corker. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be leading you through a robust discussion on cryptocurrencies, digital assets, and how to think about how uh, these technologies and assets fit into corporate treasury strategy. My name is Rachel Mayer. I'm VP of product here at Circle. Uh, and we're really looking forward to having a nice discussion on what is happening today in the market. So Patrick, as you know, the audience today is uh, corporate treasurers, finance managers, uh, and leaders across the board from a variety of different com uh, companies all over, the, all over the world. They've heard what digital currencies are and digital assets. Could you just give us like a quick high level overview of what these currencies are and this technology? Sure. Um, so round about the, the financial crisis, um, there was uh, a guy by the name of um, Satoshi Nakamoto who had an idea that there was a need uh, for a currency, um, an exchange of value methodology um, that should exist independently of the traditional banking system. Um, the view was that because the traditional banking system failed us at that time, there needed to be a better way. And over time, um, it, it sort of gleaned a following um, and much of the focus became more about um, the speculative value uh, of Bitcoin rather than the transactional efficacy of transacting on the blockchain. And today there are many crypto assets. There's many tokens that travel on blockchains. Um, Circle is primarily focused on the ability to transact really efficiently, really fast at almost no cost um, at scale on the blockchain. And so today, um, you know, we'd be really excited to talk to this group about why USDC is an ideal method of taking advantage of those um, transactional efficiencies on the blockchain uh, versus um, what is still a really impressive uh, store of value asset in the form of Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm sure we'll spend some time on that as well. Um, but because Bitcoin is, is a volatile price asset, and I think for many of those who will have watched or at least read in the news what Bitcoin does seemingly on a daily basis, um, it can be really difficult, difficult to implement that as an efficient way to transact at scale for most banks and corporates and e-commerce businesses, given the unpredictability um, uh, of the price of that asset. So why do you think, given that Bitcoin has in fact become a reserve asset for a lot of corporate treasuries around the world. Do, you know, large asset managers like Fidelity are doing recommendations and breakdowns to do it. Besides those risks, why has it become so popular to incorporate it on your balance sheet? I think for the very reasons that it was created, um, it exists independently of the existing financial system, and so. That paired with the fact that there are a finite number of Bitcoin in this world, um, and there's a general belief, and increasingly so, um, that despite you know what terminal may, we may see in sovereign governments and traditional money systems, um, Bitcoin will persist, and we've seen that to be true over the past almost 10 years now uh, since Bitcoin was created. And so, whether it be corporate balance sheets, and of course, there's always going to be your your memes about who's doing it and for what reasons and and related speculation. But you know, we have firsthand knowledge of a lot of folks that are actually doing this. We're talking to them, and there's this idea that um, it makes sense to allocate a piece of your balance sheet to this this incredible store of value that, in many ways, is is overtaking gold as a store of value. You talked a little bit about the risks. Uh, the memes, the price fluctuations. What what are some of the other risks corporate treasurers should be thinking about when adding an asset like Bitcoin to their balance sheet? So you should think of Bitcoin as very much like an equity-like risk um, in terms of the risk profile of the asset that sits on your balance sheet. And it's still a very nascent market. And so when you think about generally the maturity of markets over time, we're still in the very, very early innings. And so when you take equity-like risk in any meaningful size on your balance sheet, oftentimes CFOs and corporate treasurers are gonna think about, how do I hedge that risk? How do I make sure that I preserve that value or 
increase the probability of upside and decrease the probability of downside. And generally that's done with hedging tools like derivatives. That market um, exists today, um, but is still quite immature and quite in a, uh, price inefficient. It's, it's expensive to hedge, whether it be with futures or, or options or swaps. And so um, you, it really is very speculative and you would need to be okay uh, with a decline in the value over time. And, and, and really that portends a longer term view. And so if your view is short to medium term, it may not be an appropriate allocation for your balance sheet at this time. What about other risks and securities that are uh, more proprietary to digital assets, like thinking about custody and security and how does that differ than regular custodians that they use? Sure, it's a really good question. Um, there are some really impressive, really standout companies in the, in the custody space right now. Um, it's certainly not at the level that traditional custody is. So you wouldn't have, for example, a State Street or a BNY Mellon uh, level um, custody provider today. Uh, but if you if you canvas the space, there's a couple or three that are really, really strong and happy to, to mention who those are, but um, have made really impressive advancements in terms of how the digital assets are, are held, um, understanding what types of risks to your question that one might encounter. So there's this, for example, this concept of hot storage and cold storage. And so think of hot storage as, okay, this information and, and Bitcoin is effectively just data, right? That exists on a digital asset infrastructure. Um, that data is available to transact with on the internet. And so it's, it's relatively speaking easier to infiltrate that information, steal it, and then go do something with it. Versus cold storage, think of it taking it offline and putting it in a vault. There's more layers of protection. There's less ability to access that information in, in order to steal it. And so understanding those nuances, and then on top of it, providing world-class insurance. Insurance is really difficult in the crypto asset space because of the, the, the nascent nature of the business and quite frankly, the inability of traditional insurers to, to deeply understand these things, they tend to assign a high risk premium to this, which is generally how the insurance industry works. And so Circle is one of those companies that I think has a world-class insurance program, um, but it is challenging and there's probably not many companies that, that do have that. Um, although it's safe to say, uh, if you look at those like your BitGos and your, and your Coinbase custodies of the world, they're gonna have similar types of programs. That's an important thing to focus on and ask questions about to get comfortable is the, the insurance element. Switching gears a little bit. So we discussed the risk in Bitcoin, the different types of assets that exist for blockchain te technology. You mentioned stable coins. And obviously Circle is, uh, uh, we offer uh, payments and treasury infrastructure and are the primary issuers of, of the world's leading you know, digital dollar backed stable coin USDC. How would a corporate treasurer then use or incorporate a stable coin like USDC in, in their daily job? What, what are the different risks and trade-offs then to another asset like Bitcoin? Sure, I, I think the primary trade-off is um, understanding that, <laughs> excuse me, um, USDC is really just um, a dollar on the blockchain. It's, it's a digital dollar and so when you think about all the various things that um, a central sophisticated treasury operation might do in a corporate context, whether it be a fortune on their company, a bank, um, when you, particularly those that have international operations and FX components and um, high velocity of transactions, and maybe that's an e-commerce marketplace, for example. Um, the nice thing about USDC is you, you do not sacrifice um, you know, the, the stability of the value. Um, it's always a dollar on the blockchain. It will always transact as a dollar on the blockchain. Um, versus Bitcoin, you, you, you do have that price volatility. And so if you're transacting in size with a high degree of velocity without the ability to hedge that price risk efficiently, um, what you have today may not be what you have tomorrow. And so a corporate treasurer or CFO will always look at that and say, that's gonna be really hard to transact with. I think with that, it sort of becomes more of what we discussed earlier, where, where in theory for some people, um, Bitcoin can and will be a really nice balance sheet tool from an investment allocation standpoint, um, from a store of value standpoint, but not necessarily the tool you would use um, to, to transact efficiently. That's really where the value that stable coins bring. And 
with, with any sort of digital asset and digital currency, we've seen sort of the resurgence of secondary markets and the formation of, of capital markets built on top of these digital currencies. How does one participate in say these robust capital markets, whether it be borrowing or lending markets that are um, starting to grow massively in this space? So one of the most prevalent examples of that is, is borrowing and lending. And so there sort of exists this parallel capital markets universe in crypto where you can give fiat money, for example, and get USDC and then lend that for an unbelievable big, um, as something that looks like four to five to 600% um, versus what you would get in a traditional lending platform. Um, and there are starting to emerge platforms that are building that opportunity into a very traditional bank-like construct. And so when you think about all of the normal questions um, that a CFO or a treasurer might ask, like, how do I make sure I get my money back? How am I protected from the downside? How is this collateralized? What are my outs? What yield am I getting? What's the LTV ratio? All of these things are super, super important. And um, Circle, as one example, has, has, has built that, that type of offering. And so I know this is not meant to be a pitch for Circle products, but um, as an illustrative you know, example, if you can go in and be secured in your loan, uh, meaning for in this example, Bitcoin is pledged as collateral against it, you are over collateralized and therefore secured in your position. And you can get five, six, seven, eight percent um, over a specified duration. That tends to be a really compelling tool to a lot of folks um, in traditional finance that are comfortable with getting their money back, are comfortable with the legal the T's and C's, are comfortable um, with, with effectively having a, uh, a passive interest in the growing capital markets that are happening in crypto right now versus an equity like risk. I can provide you this credit instrument, for example, um, that does not expose you to, to the traditional volatility that you would otherwise have with uh, owning Bitcoin or Ethereum outright. Um, and, and many, um, if not most of the protections you would traditionally enjoy with something like a CD or, or a bank loan. So these structures are, uh, business to business, you know, counterparty to counterparty, uh, robust borrowing and lending uh, agreements and markets that are uh, unilateral, uh, you know, more akin to, to the traditional financial uh, markets today. Um, I'm sure some of uh, our audience members are also learning a little bit about decentralized finance and similar um, capital markets infrastructure that's happening on chain. Um, can you maybe give the audience a little bit of an overview of, of how those those markets differ between what's what's uh, in a centralized or CFI model versus a, a DeFi capital lending protocol? Absolutely. So um, there are some there are some obvious differences. I mean, I, I can say uh, DeFi is probably one of the most exciting spaces right now in all of crypto, and I think a, a good way to think about DeFi is. Um, it's it's lending without people. It's it's a lending protocol that exists entirely in software, 100%. It's an incredible tool for treasurers and for CFOs that want instant liquidity on a fully secured collateralized basis. And so if I'm someone who has sort of this unpredictable nature to my cash needs, for example, I can put in, uh, not knowing when I'm gonna need the money back, um, put in my capital for a VIG, um, uh, for a return on a fully collateralized, uh, secured basis, and then you can just pull it back out uh, when you need it. There's there's no duration, uh, if you want to think of it that way. There's no contract that says you are lending for a period of time. And so a lot of folks would say, well, at least for a piece of my balance sheet, uh, and everyone has some degree of unpredictability to their cash needs, um, that's a really important tool. And, and so, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Something that I would encourage a lot of folks to, to spend some time thinking about for that reason. Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is it's not always a guaranteed return. And so because of the dynamic nature of DeFi, um, the interest rate tends to change with market conditions. It's generally supply demand driven in those markets. Um, but one thing to pay attention to is whether or not your rate is fixed or whether it's variable uh, as you put your money in. Um, but those would be the, the primary differences that I would point folks to. So one is lending to, to 
businesses and a person, and the other is lending to machines on the internet. Effectively, yeah. <laughs> Effectively. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, before we wrap up, maybe, I mean, you've been uh, a leader in the finance space for quite some time and also in the crypto industry, though you do come from traditional, you know, investment banking and capital markets from firms such as Goldman and whatnot. What advice do you have for the audience and, and leaders um, for corporate treasurers when, when thinking about incorporating this new technology or even for their own careers going forward? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I Mostly, more than anything else, um, invest time in trying to understand this space and who are the major players and who are the trustworthy counterparties. And it's a big space, <laughs> excuse me, and it's growing really, really quickly. And there are some um, some companies that have differentiated themselves, um, companies that are worthy of taking on customers like yourselves. And I, I think Circle is one of those. There are others. Um, but at the very least, spend time with those types of companies understanding what's possible and ask the hard questions and get the answers you're looking for and be ready um, to make a decision because this is where a lot of traditional finance is going. And we're seeing that happen now behind closed doors, I think. There will be announcements and partnerships and business that will you will see stream through the media in the coming months and years. And um, I would just encourage all of you to at least be knowledgeable about why these things are happening. And a lot of that is just spending time with people. I know culturally circles very, very open to having those conversations with people. I personally spend a lot of time with CFOs and treasurers just having these types of conversations and helping to acclimate them um, to what's happening and why and, and, and why it's something to trust and why it's real. Um, so very happy to to lend you know my calendar to folks who may want to take us up on that. But um, even if you're not ready to allocate balance sheet today or participate in this space fundamentally, um, spend some time trying to to understand a little more. Go down the crypto rabbit hole, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Once you go, you never go back. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, in, in the spirit of learning more. Uh, after this, there'll be a, a guide for the audience um, with a dedicated uh, ebook that you can go and learn more about Circle, about USDC, about how to think about corporate treasury, and a lot about what we talked to um, in, in, the, in this 30 minutes today. And to Patrick's point, reach out to Circle if you have any question. We're, he we're here to help as a resource, uh, team at circle.com. Um, and wish you the best of luck and thanks for the time today. My pleasure. Thank you.